Questions? Katie's still having problems with knitting. I uh, think we can talk about this. Uh, knitting? Yeah, I haven't knitted on one of these computers yet. I've just been doing it on my laptop, but Dmulti doesn't work on my laptop, so. Does it tell you about Java? When I knit. On your laptop? On my laptop, no. G GL Multi? Does it say it's like missing Java? It doesn't say that it's missing Java. I just, when I tried downloading or installing it, it just says that it's for like version 4.02, but I'm pretty sure I have Oh, that's the, just warning you that certain packages were going Well, it's still well, it's on download. It's on download? Uh-huh. Or... So. We, we can look at that. Okay, that sounds good. Because we just, again, encountered a issue with Java on a couple computers. Hmm. So you would have to go to Oracle, click on the products, go to Java. What we're looking for is downloading it. So it's, it's typically not installed anymore. Uh, and when you click on the download SE, do this one. Because this is the one that seems that was needed for the Macs. Um, it, I think it just includes a, a few more things. But if, you know, if R has it and ever needs some of the developmental files, it's already there. So you can just kind of scroll down to the Windows installer, download that and run it, and it would install the Java. And then you go back into R, Mark, uh, R Studio, and you would then go back here to your packages and install and do your GL Multi again. So even if it's already downloaded it and installed, uh, it it won't reinstall it, but it will look for all of the dependencies. And the dependent dependency that it's looking for is this R Java. Is that thing? So it'll just download and and everything uh, everything that it would need. Okay. Yeah, it does say something about Java. Yeah. So this is what you'll have to do. Okay. I don't know why. All of a sudden, it's popped up like that. But that's what we need. Yeah, you go to Oracle, Java, the products, click on the Java, and then you just kind of, I guess there's a download Java button right up at the top. Look at that. It takes you right to the page. So that's what we had to do for the max. All right. How'd the homework go? Right. Okay. Oh, we had one that didn't work. Did you get it working? I just said to spin this to a page. Okay. It never worked. You couldn't get it to like force it. The it just kept adding it back in. So after it, it removed it, but then it added it right back in. That was like the first step. Um, Yeah, because then if that's the case, then, then we have to continue like removing the next term that's not in the model. But GL Multi kind of avoids all of that stuff by figuring out what, what the simplest model is uh, by looking at all the different combinations. All right, so you did homework four, right? Three-way plus. So that was kind of meant to practice doing the, that, looking at ANOVA tables. Right, removing the terms manually. It gives you some practice, you know, doing subsets, uh, so forth. And homework five, yeah, you can use your GL multi. All right. No questions? All right, so let's go ahead and so all of our processes that we've been doing, it's utilized independent variables that are factors, categorical in nature or ordinal in nature, right? So qualitative, uh, qualitative variables. What happens 
what happens if we had continuous variables? How do we analyze those? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Nothing really changes about our analysis. We would still create our models and include those continuous variables as an independent variable, and we have to assess, do we need, it, do we need to include it in the model? Now, there are some exceptions. So there are some exceptions where maybe it's not significant, but we still want to include it because we know that there's a correlation. Okay, that's fine. We can force it, and, and we just don't interpret any of the output, any of the ANOVA tables, any of the summaries. Other times, uh, it is significant, or we don't know if it's significant, so we have to check and go through the whole process of you know, model simplification. Well, we can do your classical test, meaning looking at ANOVA tables and removing terms that are not significant. But once we start building up like three or more variables, independent variables, it then becomes quite difficult, uh, or I should say quite tedious, to check the, all the multi-way interactions and remove things one by one. Uh, so for those, you can use GL-multi again. All right? Now the catch with these GL-multi or the catch with any of this is that when you have a significant uh, continuous variable, we don't run a two-piece post-hoc test anymore because we don't need to know which groups are different. We're dealing with a variable that is continuous in nature. So what we can do then is look at our summary table and set up our interpretation. How many of you, I should say ask, how many of you attended Cameron's defense? Her presentation, all right. All right. So you heard her talk about increases. Oh uh, yeah, this variable is important, and for every unit increase in cover, you increase the chances that we're finding a rest cycle, right? That's the interpretation of continuous variable. For every increase, for every one inch increase in fish, we have a ten percent increase in the probability of finding a parasite or something like that. That's our interpretation. It's not well. 10 centimeters or 10 inches is different than 15 inches, that those aren't groups. It's a continuous variable. So to help us kind of start down that path, what we're going to start first is that simple case where we have two continuous variables okay, or two or more continuous variables and say, okay, how do we analyze this? And then once we know how to analyze it and how to make that, that interpretation, then we'll start adding in our independent variables again. All right, so this is posted on Blackboard. That's what I had to make sure I, I, I did. Uh, so the data file that we're going to use is core.csv. That out of the way. Core.csv, so you can download it. I say read it in as core.data. You can do that. It's just any of the code that I have is referenced as core.data. And that's all that read. Your console. Okay. Well, anyway, so you can read it in. It, if you want to read it in, it's something different. But yeah, the, the idea is that you went ahead and have some organism that you collected, and you measured the length, the weight, the volume, your calculated volume. And then also measure the average food intake for that organism. Any organism. So what I want you to do is go ahead and generate some summary statistics for each of the variables. How to think about how we do that, how we generate some of these summary statistics. I've got this just generic question on why can't we use the aggregate function for that? So be prepared to answer that. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go ahead and
get? Do we need some more time to download, import? Summary stats? Yeah, so why, yeah, so I just use the summary function. Yeah. You can do like mean of the length, you can do mean of the weight, you can do S, you know, load the S standard error function that, that we wrote, you know, and do that. All right, but summary function works. So why can't we do the aggregate function? Um, so that error and match.func. What did you put? Fun in there. Yeah, yeah. So we utilize the aggregate function to calculate the summary statistics for various groups. So if we have a variable that's a grouping variable of some sort, we use the aggregate cut category for that. But for this one, we just collected a single organism, right? And we measured all these variables on it. We we didn't have any group, so we just went out to some lake and caught all these all at one time. We it. We don't know where they came from other than it's at this lake. It all came from the same time. We didn't break it up into, into anything, into any, any group. So really, there's no point using the aggregate function. And even if we try to use the aggregate function, it'll probably complain because we, don't have, we didn't specify some grouping variable. All right, so we look at these data. We can see, I should put this back up again, that these are continuous variables, right? We can see they're continuous variables because the summary function reports means, medians, quartiles, you know, min and max values, and so forth. So a general question that we have with this data set is, are any of these variables correlated? Are, are any of them correlated? So how do we go about looking at that? Well, to add to some of the confusion, I proposed asking that question, are they correlated? Somebody else could look at this and say, well, does the length of the weight affect how much food is being consumed? Two different ideas. One is just correlation. If one goes up, does the other go up? If one goes up, does the other go down? Right? It's looking for an association. That second question, do larger individuals have an increase in intake, food intake, tends to imply a cause-effect relationship, right? That larger individuals need more food, so they're going to consume more food. That's our distinction between correlation and a regression analysis, all right? So this has led to a lot of confusion, a lot of different confusion. So mathematically, it's calculated the same way. There's no distinction. Right? And this, that has kind of led historically to researchers using both interchangeably. They calculated an R square, a correlation coefficient, or an R value, uh, and say, yeah, this is a correlation coefficient. Right? And then they would imply or they would conclude that, yes, larger individuals consume more food because of their increased energy demands. Right? That because implied a cause-effect relationship. But in this case, we didn't measure that. We didn't establish controls to, to set up that cause-effect relationship. So researchers use them interchangeably, but realistically, there is kind of like a conceptual dif difference in, in how we should probably explain it. So again, mathematically, there's, there's no, no difference. Now the regression analysis, if we're going to use it, we would use it in an attempt to explain some sort of functional relationship. We would utilize it to generate basically the slope coefficient. So we could then say, for every one unit increase in length, we're going to see X amount of increase in our food intake. That's where we would use regression analysis, and that implies a cause-effect relationship. You could run into problems if there isn't that cause-effect relationship, though. If we were only interested in the association, we would use correlation analysis. Now, correlation measures the interdependence of variation, which is basically, do the variables covary? So if one goes up, does the other go up? If one goes up, does the other go down? 
and, and so forth. So we can have a positive covariation or a negative covariation. The difference in R and how we specify this stuff comes down to the formula. So if we have two continuous variables and we're using a regression analysis, we have to pick one variable to be the Y in our equation and the other variable then becomes an X. So that way in this equation, X or the value of X is going to help us determine the value of Y. But in a correlation analysis, we don't assume that. So that type of analysis isn't an X and a Y. Rather, it's going to be an X1 and then an X2. And we'll use some of this in some of our code. We'll have to set it up this way because we're running a correlation and not necessarily a regression analysis. But again, mathematically, it's basically the same thing. So just kind of get the semantics out of the way. Let's talk about visualization. So what happens if we have two or more continuous variables? What kind of plots do we use? Well, we're going to use a scatter plot now. It's also called a bivariate plot. If you have three continuous variables, maybe you do a three-dimensional scatter plot. That's a possibility. Or you do a couple of scatter plots, just making sure you hit all possible combinations. Now, the scatter plots are going to reveal the correlations or associations between two continuous variables. Uh, the built-in plot function will recognize that you're working with two continuous variables and make the correct plot. But if you wanted to use the plot function from the car package, you would use scatter plot. Now again, some people look at scat the actual scatter plot function in the car package as being a little bit prettier. That's up to you. I'm just going to utilize plot right now. So to do plot, you've got y as a function of x. You're going to have to pick one of your variables to function as the y, and the other then is the x. All right, and you can name a lot of different stuff here. And now what we're getting into is setting our axis limits, both the x and the y axis limits, and now we can introduce some of the labels. So why do we introduce x lim and y lim? Well, it's because go back to how it what you've learned about making figures. You want your data to take up the majority of the figure itself. So while R might make a decent graph, maybe you want to make it bigger. You may have your data take up basically all of the plot space. Well, we can adjust the X and Y axis by using X lim and Y lim. And we do it by saying, let's say, X lim equals C, parentheses, and then the minimum value and the maximum value of the axis. Just like how we could kind of do it in R, or not in R, in Excel. Change your axis, format your axis, you say minimum value 0, maximum value 10. Uh, this could be useful also if you have like a negative value and you say, oh, that they can't go negative, so I want to fix it at 0, you might have to manually set the limits. The other thing is the type. Do we want points? have it only listed as points. If we want to connect the points with a line, right? so that would be points and a line, or do we only want the lines to appear? That's an L. Or do you want to have it so instead of the line going going around the points, you can, we can mess around with it so you can see what it is. You actually have the line go through the points. Uh, so a couple different types. Typically, I would use B to have the point and the line. Uh, if I wanted a line, if I wanted to show that connection. And then main, xlab, uh, and ylab are axis labels. PCH is a point type, uh, and color is a color of points. So you could add points to a graph and then specify what symbol to use or what color to use if you want to have multiple ranges on our plot. So here's different symbols different numbers that go with the symbols. You can easily find this in uh, through Google or through some textbooks with R. They do, you know, they'll plot these and say, yeah, the default, I think, is, gen is generally 19 or 20, which is just a circle, uh, filled circle, and, and the outline is outlined. And on these, you, we even have the ability to change the color of the fill and the color of the line 
on those. Uh, perhaps we want to use a circle, and then perhaps we want to use an open circle. You can use one. All right. Or if you wanted to use letters, you can specify letters if you wanted to. So there's a, there's a lot of different points for there. So here's a scatter plot of weight as a function of, of length. All right. This was made in R. I made this in R. I exported it as a JPEG so I can get it here. All right. This is going to represent the, gra the, the association between weight and length. All right. So we would think longer fish are heavier. I would, I would assume if this is a fish. So what I want you to do is use the plot function, use some of the adjustments, some of the options for that plot function to try to make this appear, to make your plot appear like this. I pay attention, I added a title to it. I changed our labels, made sure our labels were there. Right? Pay attention to maybe the axis limits, you know, what was plotted. And this was probably either a 16, 19, or 20, whatever the points are. The difference on those are a slightly different size, and one of those doesn't have a line around it, which makes it look smaller. See if you can kind of make this using the plot function. What's your error? Well, it's telling the object is weight is constant, which is a little odd. So the weight is good. Lowercase? text that you put on the graph. So okay. Yeah, so any text that we put on the graph has to be in parentheses. Does the entire thing have to be in parentheses or does it main equals? No, main equals and then in parentheses. So it's saying the main title is weight as a function of length and I need that in quotation marks or parentheses. Quotation marks, quotation marks. We need that in quotation marks because we're telling R this is text. 
add inside parentheses, quotation marks. So to get our labels to appear, we want, we're writing a text. That's what we're writing, we're writing strings. So those have to be in our quotation marks, singular double quotes. And I, I just, you put them on new lines so you can see, so we can talk about how I did each one. Did you figure out color? Yeah, I didn't put the right PCH. I tried 19 because that seems to be the result. Yeah, that's what I did too. Oh, so it's not exactly like this. Now, just out of curiosity, what do you notice different between the one that we've just made here and the one that's in the presentation? What's that? The font the font is different. It is different. Well, did you really expect someone to say that? It is, well, no, it is. It is different, and that's what I was going for. Because if you make something like this for, let's say, your thesis or presentation, you're going to have that one jerk of, an, of a committee member say, your font's different, right? Right, Blake? Yep. Your font's different. All right, you have to be consistent. So there is a way to change the font, but that is on, that's a graphical parameter. Go to help. So you would have to do search for par, which is short for parameters. And what we can do is set the default font type um, so that it always appears a certain way. This is also where we can set our margins, um, and, and everything. So, you know, things that we're looking at is basically font, family, family, font family is serif, sans, or mono. Uh, this is a sans type font. You know, if you wanted it to appear like it's Times New Roman, you would need to use the, the uh, serif font. And there's also a way where you can actually give it the proper font. So if you, if you need it to appear as, let's say, I don't know, Helvetica or something like that, you can make it as Helvetica. If you ever need that, come talk to me. I'll help you out. Mine didn't get an error, but like, all my like, number one. <laughs> number one, did you put this in parentheses? Like this? Or not in parentheses, quotation marks? So something like that? Yeah, it looks exactly like this. How about you take out those quotes around the PCH 19? Did that work? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, color, if you wanted to change a color, you can refer to it by name. How do we how do we figure out what colors are available? Help help figured out. Help? Help code? <laughs> Colors. Open and close parentheses. These are all by by num these yeah, I you know, I talk about this in the undergrad stats. Look at all these. Like if you wanted light sky blue four, yeah, you can you can do that. Look at you've got basically a hundred grays. I'll fix it. How many different grays are there? There are different shades of grays. Fifty shades. Yep. So I mean huge. So yeah, there's an Alice blue, whatever that is. Antique white, antique white one, antique white two. They all look white to me. Right? So if you need it, if you need it, you can change that. If you needed to change the background, you, you can do that. So you know, if you decide to give a presentation with a back black with a black background and yellow font, maybe you need your figures to be black with the yellow font. 
you can do it. We can specify background, we can specify foreground colors, and do all this stuff. There's a lot of cool you stuff. You can do the number? What's that? You just, oh, wait, you type in what's in quotation. Yeah, you can do what's in quotation. You can also give it like the RGB numbers, you can give it the CMYK numbers, you can give it hex values. So yeah, that's where that that's where the help file could could come into play. Again, if you need to get this stuff modified and fixed, maybe you need two graphs side by side. Come talk to me. We can do it. Maybe you need two graphs side by side and then one big graph underneath them. We could do it. All right. Come talk to me. I'll help you out. That's like a seminar class on how to how to make graphics in R. So just showing some of the power. But this is this will this will work, right? Scatter plot. Here it is, shows our relationship, it looks like a positive relationship, all right? Uh, could we add a trend line? You bet, yeah. and we'll learn how to do that. Did it work? Yeah. What's not working? Exactly the same. Looks exactly like mine. Oh, my God. Unexpected symbol. Unexpected symbol. Who did that the Scatter plot, not too bad. You can also do it in uh, the car package. Um, car package might be a little bit better because it allows you to add smoothers. It allows you to add a best fit line automatically. Um, and that one that, that we're talking about is the lowest lines and, and so forth. So, you know, it still has, you can still specify your, your, your labels, specify your limits and so forth. Uh, has subset functions, but we can say a uh, regression line, reg.line equals ln to say, yeah, I want you to add a regression line, and then also add another line, this smoother line, that kind of takes averages of different points to kind of get a, not a best fit straight line, but more of a, a curve, curve line. This is basically a best fit polynomial regression. If you didn't want it, you can just say smoother equals false, uh, if you didn't want the regression line, you can do reg dot line equals false. Uh, if you wanted to add extra box spots, so a box spot for the x axis and a box spot for the y axis, you can add those, and you can do it by groups. So if you had groups, uh, like a grouping variable, we can specify the grouping variable and then say, yeah, make a separate scatter plot for each of our groups, and not just a separate scatter plot but also separate regression lines. So we could do that with the regular plot function, but it's a little bit harder. So this is, I believe, just a default. I changed, uh, changed some stuff, uh, changed the labels, uh, but for the most part, if we use scatter, scatter plot uh, from the car package, this is what we get. So the green line is our straight line, the red line is what's called our smoother, our, our lowest line. Uh, and that kind of, we would utilize that lowest line to see, do we have a, a linear relationship or is it somewhat curved? Right here I can see this is basically a straight linear relationship. Uh, Blake, come, come to our pre his presentation on Friday at 2. All right, he'll show you a graph that, that is curved. So if he used the scatter plot, it, he would get the straight line for the green line, but then the lowest line would actually reveal the curvature in, in our data. So we can talk about that. So I just say as practice, 
use the scatter plot function to do the relationship between length and food intake. So just pick one as our, as our dependent variable, as the y, pick, pick, use the other one as our x, just to make sure it, you can make it so you can see what it looks like. Make sure the car package is loaded too. We, we don't have any groups. Okay. But if I take it out, I get an error message. If I take out groups, and then you show to take out by groups. Oh, okay. Check the help file. <clears throat> ah, it's reg line now. Yeah, the new so when when the car package updated that allowed us to do like the QQ plots by writing the formula. Yeah, they updated this one too. So uh, so instead of reg dot line, it should just be your reg line. Capital. So. Try that. So reg line. All right. Uh, smooth. That's a good number that's up here. Now that there's a goal. Sledge into groups. Five groups. Yeah, smooth is already on there. That's the default. So that's what the smoother was. Let's go down and look at smooth. Yep. The default smoother is lowest line. So we can do just smooth. Lowest line. Do that. There we go. Still has groups and by groups. What the ellipse does, that's new. Oops. 
try ellipse. See what that does. Ooh. What's that? What purpose does that serve? It looks neat. Uh, gives you 90, 95% confidence in interval for the X and the Y relationship. So we'll, we'll talk about it. So I'm going to go up to weight and length just to, and use that again. Because we've already made it. Oops. Uh, Look at that relationship. When you add the ellipse, it's very elongated. And as we talk about it, as we talk about like the regression and fitting, yeah, if it's a perfect fit, if our correlation is one, it's going to be a straight line. But as we lose, as we as we start increasing variation around our, our predictor equation, you start to get the shading, the, the confidence ellipse. So if you had two groups, on these, and you had two different ellipses on them, if the groups were significantly different, then you're going to minimize how much overlap you have on these ellipses. And you could kind of demonstrate, you could kind of show that graphically or, you know, uh, statistically. All right, so where did the colors come from? Uh, I believe the colors. I'd have to look how to, how to do the colors. The colors in the presentation used to be the default. They used to do this by default, which I think looks a whole lot better than making everything blue. So I'd have to look into it. But we would use the scanner plot to assess whether or not a relationship is linear. Um, and and we, will, we will use that. All right, any questions? This is the length and food. Again, default, I think, looks a whole lot better than the blue. Uh, and I'll look up how to, how to go about doing that. All right, so we're interested in the correlation. We're interested in the association. And so we've got two random variables at this point. All right, we didn't, we're not assigning any one as being an independent variable and, or a dependent variable. Just going to say both of them are basically both independent variables. Uh, so we refer to these as random variables. Now, with the random variables, as we'll see, and, and as you probably heard Cameron mention, we've got fixed variables and you have random variables. So a random variable is a variable that's not under our control. So, like for Cameron's stuff, it was the skunk, the individual skunk. It's a random variable. That skunk is not under her control. But a fixed variable is under the control of the, the researcher in a way in that we can measure without error. So when she sets the skunks and has a male skunk and a female skunk, right, that's a fixed variable. Sex was a fixed variable. Yeah, she couldn't say, hey, I want you to be a female. All right, it wasn't that regards. But you have this variable that is determined. If she only wanted to look at male skunks, she could, she could do that. If she only wanted to look at female skunks, she could do that. So for us, what we're really looking at is just two random variables, and we're looking at their association. Now, the correlation actually measures covariance, and that's a mathematical term. Equation uh, to, to calculate it. Uh, so that a covariance, if it's a zero, means that there is no association. If one goes up, then you've got a 50-50 chance that the other one will also go up. All right? But if you have a positive covariance, then as one increases, the other will also increase. If the covariance is negative, if one increases, the other is going to decrease. The units for a covariance is actually a product of both units, which, which kind of poses problems because we can't really in interpret that. So our association between length and food intake, well, length is millimeters, food intake might be grams. Covariance is grams, millimeters. How do you even interpret that? Right? So this has kind of led to the 
to the idea of correlation, which takes that covariance and normalizes it. Normalizes it by the standard deviation of each. So that has the effect of eliminating the units. So we don't have to worry about what the units are. And correlation then can apply to any two variables of interest. The relationships still stay the same. If it's zero, there is no correlation. If one increases, you still have the 50-50 chance that it's going to increase or decrease. But if you have a positive association, then if one increases, the other one will also more likely increase. A negative association is if one increases, the other will decrease. Uh, if you ever get a correlation equal to one, and this is plus one or negative one, then we have a perfect association. All right. Covariance is not bounded by one. Correlation is. All right. So our correlation coefficients. There's actually a couple of them that we could we could look at. The one that you've probably seen is R. Right? This is Pearson's correlation. We would use R sub x y to represent the correlation between variables x and y in our samples. And we can do this in any pair of variables. So we can use R and then in subscripts, length, comma, width to represent the correlation between length and width. All right, we can, if we added, uh, let's say another one that is like speed, swimming speed, right? You have length and swimming speed. Well, those are two different units, but it doesn't matter. Correlation kind of neutralizes that. So any pair of variables, we can calculate a correlation. Also, we can calculate correlation regardless of the underlying distribution. So they don't have to be normally distributed. Right? You can have one that's normally distributed. You can have the other one that is skewed very heavily to the right. Or you can have one that's skewed heavily to the right and the other that's skewed heavily to the left. There is no requirement to calculate this correlation. However, if we're going to try to test if the correlation is different from zero, then we do have some requirements for the underlying distribution. So don't get caught up and say, well, yeah, Dr. Nagavetich said we can use this regardless of our distribution. I did say that. But I also said if you're going to do a, run a statistical test to see if this value is different from zero, to see if it is a significant positive or significantly uh, negative correlation, then you do have to make sure that you're working with the correct distributions. R is a sample correlation. We utilize our sample correlation to estimate the population level correlation, which is now rho. All right, so just go back to our introductory lecture. Very first class, we talked about the difference between samples and populations, right? Samples utilize your, your letters, your regular letters. Populations were represented by our Greek letters. All right, so our sample correlation will approximate our population level correlation only if X and Y are what's called bivariate normal distribution. They're both normally distributed. All right, but catch with this is if we have a small sample size, then we're going to be biased. We're going to slightly underestimate the true population parameter. What's a small sample size? Basically under 40. Because once we hit 40, then that bias becomes negligible. It becomes so small that we can ignore it. How do we analyze or how do we visualize these associations, scatter plots? There's also a thing as a three-dimensional histogram, too that we could do, look at that bi bivariate relationship. Uh, are we going to do that? Nope, we're not. I just present it here so you can see that we can actually do that. Uh, R has some pretty cool three-dimensional graphing capabilities. Uh, it can actually make a figure, and then you can go into the window and rotate it into the correct position, and then you can kind of like fix it, take a snapshot of it. Pretty cool. All right, so. What are the statistics related to this R? Well, coefficient of determination is one. That's our R square value. Right? We've seen it in the regression summaries. This tells us the proportion of variation of one variable that's determined by the variation in the other. Note the variation. 
determined by another's variation. Sounds very similar to covariate, right? Which is what correlations are doing, the standardized covariance. So coefficient of determination is percentage of that variation that's accounted for by the variation of the other. This is typically used when we're, when we're trying to apply some sort of cause-effect relationship. 1 minus r squared is a coefficient of non-determination, so it's just the, basically the opposite. Coefficient of alienation uh, is a little bit different. That kind of talks about the lack of association between two variables, which maybe it would be useful. I, I've never used it. I've never really seen it being used. I'm just presenting it for completeness, and I probably won't ever ask you what the coefficient of alienation is. The one that we typically use is coefficient of determination. These are the most commonly one used terms in our regression analysis. So let's talk about the types of correlation statistics that we can calculate and how we can test if we have significant correlations. So there's going to be three. First one is Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient. This is a parametric method, requires normally distributed variables. If we don't have normally distributed variables, then we should probably use a non-parametric. The two that we can choose from is Spearman's coefficient of rank correlation and Kendall's co coefficient of rank correlation. So Spearman's or Kendall's. What we're going to do is introduce Pearson's first. All right, Pearson's is the most common type that you'll see. This is R. This is lowercase r. As I said, the assumption is that it's they're normally distributed, and that we have no outliers. So how do we calculate it? Use the function core. Core for correlation. All right, we give it one variable, we give it our second variable, and we say method equals Pearson, which is the default. That is the default. Now there is a catch with this. So sometimes you collect your data, and you are able to measure the data for one of your variables, but not for the other. In this case, you have to tell R how to handle that, that association, that pair, where you have data for one but not for the other. All right? So what you typically have to do is use complete.obs in parentheses. So that means is when you calculate this correlation, only use the pairs that have data for both of your variables. This could be a problematic though if you're doing, let's say, le weight, length, and food intake, and you don't, and you're trying to do correlations between all possible combinations. If you do that, you may be missing length for one individual, which means you calculate the coefficient for weight and food intake. All right, but then that individual doesn't have any other correlation or doesn't contribute any correlations, for lack thereof, uh, in the other comparison. So the weight and food intake, or the weight and the length. Uh, so it's just something you have to you have to pay attention to. But if you have missing data points, uh, you'll probably get an error, which means go back and, and put the use use complete obs use equals complete obs in, in quotation marks. All right. I think I have. So that's Pearson's product moment. If you can guess, all that we'll have to do is change method if we want to use Spearman or Kendall. That's all we're going to have to do. So let me introduce these non-parametric methods. So we're going to use these rank-based methods when we know the variables are not bivariate normal, when they're not normally distributed. Examples of this, let's say we're trying to estimate emergence times and correlate it to, let's say, size. So maybe we're interested in emergence of insects, um, and we measured their size before they pupated, right? and we think that larger individuals will um, emerge earlier, or take a shorter amount of time to emerge. Right? That's order of emergence is inherently non-normal. Right? It's an order. We're going to basically rank when our insect emerges. So we're going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and so forth. And if they emerge on the same day, they're both going to receive the same number. All right, that's non-normal. Don't use Pearson's. 
Order of germination times. Again, ordering. Two ordering, again, if it's just the order itself is not normal. Uh, if we have similarity arrays, so we go up and we're all 21, right? All right, so let's say we have everyone. So let's say we have, uh, we go up after the semester's over. Everyone's done. We go out to celebrate Blake's, Blake's defense. Right. We get five beers. I buy everyone five beers, and they say, I want you to rank these. Right. And we'll, do, we'll do student rankings versus faculty rankings. And when we want to see how close our rankings are together. This is comparing similarity arrays. We wouldn't use, we wouldn't use Pearson's. We'd use some probably Kendall's talk to do that. Right. And also, if we have different correlation values for different values of x, so this would be a case where maybe you have a correlation, like a positive correlation at small values of x, but then negative correlation at large values of x. In that case, we don't want to use Pearson's. Uh, we want to use some other rank-based method. So what does this mean to be rank-based method? You're basically taking the variables, the numeric variables, and you're ranking them in order. And then, based on that order, you do the correlation on those orders. So you're assessing the rank of x versus the rank of y. Now, the actual calculation, how to, how to come up with the correlation varies for the method, but both of them use some sort of ranking system. Spearman's coefficient is our ranking coefficient. All right. And this one's either, you'll see it reported as, as rho, Spearman's rho, or it would be lowercase r with a sub s, subscript s on it. I think people use this r subscript s to avoid confusion that rho would talk, that rho would suggest that you're working at a population level. Right. Either of them, row, Spearman's row is what I would, I would probably reference. This is what's called a product moment correlation coefficient of the ranks. It's using the ranks. So capital R sub X and capital R sub Y, that's the rank. And how it kind of works is does the subtraction of the ranks row by row and to see how close it is. If they have the exact same rankings, right? If they have the exact same rankings, then this term, R, the rank of item one minus the rank of item of that same item one is going to be zero. So this whole thing becomes zero, which means our, our row is one. As our ranks become different, now we're going to increase the value of this side up to the point where we approach one, bringing us back to zero. So that's kind of what this is try, trying to uh, explain. Our interpretation of the value is going to stay the same. If it's zero or close to zero, there's no correlation. The farther it is or the closer it is to one, plus or minus one, the more highly correlated it is. For this one, all we have to use is change our method to Spearman. Works like a charm. And again, don't forget, we might have to use complete OBS to get rid of our, our missing data. Kendall's coefficient is tau. All right. They don't have like T, subscript K, or anything like that. This is just Kendall's tall. This is probably more accurately termed a measure of concordance. And concordance is the degree of agreement between the order of two variables. So if we were ranking, again, faculty versus, versus student rank, rankings, we're looking at the concordance between those two. Its calculation is this. It's measuring the conformity to strict monotonicity. What that strict monotonicity is, is it's always increasing or it's always decreasing. If our ranks consistently increase together, we're going to have a high correlation, which puts this value close, close to 1. All right? If we have one, our rank for variable x going up, but then the rank for variable y goes down, we've broken that monotonicity, we've broken that concordance, which drives us closer to zero. All right. I give you the equations, we're, again, we're not ever going to do this by hand, because 
All we have to do is say method equals Kendall. And R will handle it for us. So I did have a box on uh, the biometry book. You can find a biometry book in or the book titled Biometry by Sokol and Rolf at the library. If you wanted to actually calculate it by hand, you could. Don't know why you would do it since you know how to use R. So as practice, we're going to look at length and weight. Go ahead and calculate Sp Pearson, Spearman's, and Kendall's correlation coefficients. And again, we have to reference the variable, right, length and weight, but we have to tell R where it's found, so you can utilize the width command to do that. Make your life easier. don't use the width function, then you have to use your data dollar sign variable. Um, I included it here. <clears throat> so data dollar sign length, data dollar sign weight. Doesn't matter what order we put them in. Doesn't matter what order we put them in. And then I also use the uh, width. No, I don't think we have any missing data. Okay. But uh, I would use this. Use equals and then in our quotations complete dot ops. Maybe I'll throw that in. The exam question had a missing data form. Comes up as NA. So, length and weight are highly correlated. As I said, it doesn't matter what order you put them in. 
because it's looking at co covariance and then standardizing it. <clears throat> so if one increases and the other decreases, it's going to be negative no matter which one is listed first. So for us, we've got very high correlations. 0.97 for Pearson, 0.96 for Spearman, 0.84 for Kendall. Right? Why at the decrease? Why do we get a decrease in correlation when we switch to rank-based method? Sample size. Is it the same data set? What's that? What happens to our data when we use these methods? What's the first thing that they do? Say what? They rank them. They rank them. So what is lost when we rank them? Yeah, the actual value is difference. Yeah, yeah. So the, the difference between rank one and rank two is one rank. But that could be having a length of five and then a length of 15 because you had that, you had the smallest one, the next one, the closest one is 15. We've lost that information. So that's one of the consequences of working with, with ranks mm -hmm. is that we lose some of the information on magnitude differences. We can do that. And then also with the rankings, the question becomes, how do you handle ties? How do we handle ties? Kind of same issue we have when we, when we do uh, medians. All right, so yeah, they're, they're all, both, all highly correlated. I do put this, 94.4% of the variation in weight is accounted for by variation in length. How did I calculate that? Good question, right? was math. What did I do? Oh, what happened? Copy. Times paste. It's the R squared. <laughs> the R squared. That's all it is. So at least when you, when you report Pearson's correlation, you can easily then talk about percent variation. Easily talk about percent variation. And just take that value and square. All right, so which one to use? Pearson's uh, is okay for most situations, unless you have outliers or if you have extreme skew. All right. And then if you have any of those, then it just kind of comes down to preferences, maybe? Uh, Spearman's row is basically the non-parametric version of Pearson's. It converts it to rank and then basically does the same calculation. All right. It does reduce the effect of outliers. It reduces the effect of skew, but it doesn't really negate it. All right. It doesn't really negate it. So for that reason, if you have smaller sample size, it's probably preferred to use Kendall's taw over Spearman's row. All right, and Kendall's taw also reduces, significantly reduces the effect of, of outliers and, and skew. All right, now if you do have order of events, yeah, use Kendall's taw. Without a doubt, use Kendall's taw for that. But if you have any of this non-normality going on, probably I would use Kendall's taw unless somebody says otherwise and then go ahead and use uh, Spearman's row. If you have large sample sizes, then it doesn't necessarily matter which one you use. 
either one was going to be over anything. All right. Questions? I think we're going to stop here. Because now the next step is we, now these are very high. These are going to be significant. But you calculate a value. And let's say instead of 0.97, you get a value of 0.2. You might be tempted to say, well, yeah, I've got a correlation there. It's, it's 0.2. That's different from 0. But is it different from 0? If you took another random sample of your data set, would you get the same calculation? So our next step then is, are these significant correlations? Are these values significantly different from zero? Yes or no? So what we'll learn uh, on Monday is test of significance, this Cordoff test, which is pretty easy. Uh, actually, on Monday, first, we'll answer questions with the homework number five if you have them. All right? And then we'll introduce the, this test. Uh, we will stay on track, not the test next week, but the test the following week. All right, and we'll make it go live, we'll probably make it go live on Friday so that you've got the weekend to, to work on it if you want. All right, and in that exam will only cover our two-way or and higher A note model. So model simplification and interpretation. Nice. All right. It will be. Yeah, it might be, yeah, three questions. Right <laughs> 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 All right. <laughs> yep. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, I'll answer questions about homework.